Coming up in two minutes is the 11th episode of the Good Grief, Good God Show, hosted by Grammy nominee and Emmy award-winning hit songwriter, 15 top 10 songs, including nine number ones, Brad Warren of the Warren Brothers. I'm producer Matt Pivito. Join Brad monthly on the first and third Tuesdays on your favorite audio platform or video on YouTube for raw, honest conversation about surviving things that suck. For today's episode, Brad welcomes five-time CMA nominee, two-time Grammy, and two-time ACM award winner, singer-songwriter Natalie Hemby. So a little bit about Natalie. Natalie signed her first publishing deal when she was 19 and has become one of the most successful and sought-after songwriters in music. She has written hit songs such as Brandon Lambert's White Liar, Only Prettier and Automatic, Little Big Towns, Pontoon and Tornado, and Kelly Musgrave's Rainbow. Her songs have also been recorded by the likes of Dirks Bentley, Toby Keith, Maren Morris, Sheryl Crow, Lady Gaga, to Kelly Clarkston. In 2019, Natalie stepped from the songwriting room into the national spotlight as a member of the High Women, sharing the lineup with Brandi Carlisle and Maren Morris and Amanda Shires, followed by an independent release in 2021, Pins and Needles. You're about to find out the greatest thing about Natalie is not her accomplishments, but who she is as a person. You're about to find out that her faith, humility, sincerity, and grace are second to none. Brad would say he is blessed to know her and call her a friend. Provided in the description are clickable links to connect to the show on social media, and to watch on YouTube, or to listen to your favorite audio platform, and to visit goodgreekgoodgodshow.com, where you'll find the most up-to-date show information, including links to the back catalog of episodes. Also provided in the description is a clickable link to visit Natalie's website, natalieheminy.com. If you'd like to help support the show, please hit that subscribe button. Leave us a comment. Give us a big old five-star review. It means so much to us. On the behalf of Brad's wife, Michelle, segment producer and guest booker, Lisa Bolt, thank you for tuning in. The Good Grief, Good God Show is brought to you in loving memory of Sage Michael Warren. I'm not a bad friend. I'm just a bad social media person, but I just kind of like, you know, just because we were doing this, kind of looked up and you were doing tons of shit. I feel sort of like Forrest Gump. Like, I'm not joking. <laughs> you say that all the time. Do you? To the point that Brett and I were sitting with Tom Hanks and told him the story. We always called ourselves Forrest, uh, Forrest Gump. Yeah, because you're and like, how are you in the pier? How did I wind up with the president? <laughs> Brett always says we come back from some some trip to Tim McGraw's island, landing on his private jet, and we get in our Toyota Corolla and the battery's dead. It's an all-star. <laughs> you know what I mean? There was a lot of years of that. We're like, he would go through his wardrobe after a tour and just give us all his clothes. I'm like, oh, thank God. Not that we didn't have clothes, but we definitely didn't have cool clothes. We didn't have those clothes. Yeah. We'd probably like, resell for thousands yeah. of dollars. We should. I wound up giving them to other people. And I gave Ernest a pair of his boots. I think he still wears them. Well, next time Tim has a pair of boots, give them to me. So. It's been so long. <laughs> All right, Matt, are you settled down over there? Yeah, yeah. I'm just fix a quick audio problem. It'll take five or ten minutes, but y'all go ahead and start. Does my hair look okay? I always say Dolly Parton's uh, says it takes a lot of money for me to look this cheap, and I say it takes a lot of money for me to look this average. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're just talking about all that you're doing. Like, tell me all that you, before we get into the big stuff. Well, I was literally born into the Amy Grant camp. I mean, my mom and dad, um, they moved here when I was really young and from Southeast Missouri. And my my dad played with the Imperials. But my mom, she, uh, okay, so I was a very sick child. Well, my mom, she got let go of her, from her job because she was always taking me to the hospital. So they fired her. So she started cleaning houses and doing nails for people. And she started cleaning Amy's house. And when she was cleaning one day, she was like, listen, I am really good with organization and keeping a house together. You clearly need help. Like with this, why don't you let me be your personal assistant? And she has been her personal assistant for over, for almost 40 years. Oh, you kid still today. Amy Grant. Yes. Oh my God. So it's, yeah. It's so, like your aunt or something. Yeah. She is like, she's so influ- influential in my life and in my music and my family. I like, we would, my family wouldn't be where we are today. She has three or four of my favorite quotes ever. Yeah. That come from her. And she is an amazing human being. And actually, I know um, one of her nephews, a friend of mine, and uh, just a lot of of, of uh, close things uh, to me 
where I know who she is and what she is, and she's amazing. Yes. Even though I don't know her really well, this shouldn't be an outlier in Christian music, but she's like the honest Christian music person. Like, yeah. She I is. only say golf needs a, a guy that looks like me. Because like, <laughs> yes. golf is boring. Golf yes. needs some. Golf needs an Andre Agassi or something different. Christian music needs some more Amy Grants that just say, "Hey." Yeah. Well, I. I the reason up, why we loved I'm, her music was because she was be struggling and she would write about that, you know. And I feel like that's. That's something that I, Christian music in the 80s did more of back then. And I actually really loved it. Now, I, I loved, uh, I liked all kinds of music, you know. Um, there's always bad country music, too. So Yeah, yeah. And like, so in, in the, the, like. Like Red Solo Cup. Who wrote that? I mean. No, what <laughs> I love that song so I much. I mean, we laugh about it. We we play a lot of, well, we'll get into that. We play yeah. a lot of corporate gigs together. Um to our advantage and we just get to sit and watch you play like amazing songs but we always compare the red solo you equally i get to do that with you guys so and then i get to play like bluebird with you which is great but <laughs> going back to the other stuff you're doing so the high women like yes. I, I know what that is but like how did that come about it's well the high women started with um you know uh it was amanda shires and she decided to, as a spinoff of the highway men to start she wanted to start a group called the high women and if you say it differently, you know, the emphasis yeah. sounds like the high women. So she asked Brandy Carlisle first and Brandy was like, I'm so into this. And then they asked Marin to do it. And Aaron was like, I'm totally in. And then Dave Cobb called me and was like, will you write songs for this? And he was like, we really need like a, we need like some fun songs. We need like a song that everybody can sing along to. So I wrote, I wrote Crowded Table with Rory McKenna and I wrote, um, uh, redesigning women with Rodney Clausen, <laughs> which I love that. So Rodney's my friend up for a long time. So we wrote those songs and then they called me. They were like, you want to come and sing on it? And I was like, I was in my head, I'm like, what's your band? But I, uh, okay, if you need another voice. So I go in and sing on it. And then right after Amanda and Brandy were like, Hey, do you want to be in our band? And I did not say yes at first. I was like, I think so. I was like, what does that mean? I was going to say, can you tell me the schedule? <laughs> yeah, I was like, and, and, and she's like, well, you can be in it as little or, or as much as you like. She goes, but we're going to be uh, playing at the Newport Folk Festival with Dolly. And I said, oh, I'm totally in. So that's kind of how it came about. So are you doing anything this year coming up? This year is kind of my writing year. You know, to be a great writer, you have to, you have to really um, spend some time alone and read and take in what people are saying and listen to other people's music. Actually, I think that's probably one of the best pieces of advice that Amy gave me when I was a kid. Um, she said, you always need to listen to other people's music. And at the time, that's all I did. So I didn't really, was like, it's kind of stupid. Why now you understand what she's saying because like, listening to music can be painful now. <laughs> you can. And also, you know, it, you're, sometimes you're just up your own rear end for so long and you're writing songs for yourself or for somebody else that you don't stop and just pay attention to what, what, what's being made out in the world. When we wrote for Tim McGraw, uh, I mean, we've written a lot of songs for him, but we wrote for his publishing company, right? Before we had any hits, he, he liked our writing and he cut a few of our songs and we had a deal with Sony that was up and he said, Hey, I want to start a publishing company. Why just write for me? I'm, I'm the one cutting your songs anyway. So, and, and although Tim is not a, a writer as much, he's the, one of the best song people. We all oh, would yeah. agree that he can pay. He just knows he's great a great songs. song here. And he always had. And the first thing he said to us is, you guys write too many songs. And he sent us to, he goes, you need to go to, go to Europe. And he sent like, we went to England to see a friend of ours. Just, he goes, you need to get out of town yeah. and out of this country and just don't write too many songs. You have to live to have something to write about. And I, I maintain that because some different people do it different ways. I have friends that write 120, 130, 40 songs in a year. We have, we did that one year or two years. Um, and we wrote like 120 songs and we had so many less cuts and less great, fewer great songs than we'd ever had. When we wrote 80 songs, yeah. we had about five of them that meant something and they were important in a couple hits and, and you can't really just judge it on the hits, but I, I'm the fewer songs we write, the better they are. Yeah. What well, comes on you? You're wasting ideas on, yeah. Yeah. How, um, on sort of mediocrity, if you will, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm just like, I'm just, a, you're pouring into just getting it done. Than you are into like making it great. You want to write with artists, 
and that's you've had the best even in the cool segment of like we work in a cool industry you have managed to find the coolest artist to love you like Mar uh, 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 Casey Musgraves, Miranda Lambert, Lady Gaga, Alicia Keys. I've totally, I've totally fooled them all. No, I, you know what? A lot of these people start off as my friends, honestly. Uh, Marin rolled into town and I called her first and was like, I love your songs you write. Let's get together and write. And, uh, and then Casey and I were friends before we ever really started. Like, I just liked her music. And that's that goes back to what Amy's saying. Always appreciate other people's music. I just I started realizing like Miranda doesn't need me, but what can I bring from to Miranda is what I'm trying to always. Think. We're in a service industry. Yes, we are. We are in a service. If we forget that, then we get too artistic for our own good. Yes, and and sometimes like you know, I, and I also don't hinge my whole friendships on whether or not you cut my song or never ever do i mention it never no never i don't like either with Tim, like you you lean i just don't ever just don't do it like some people yeah you go out to la and you don't know these people yes you're coming to write for their record and you hope you get a song on there i'm also at a stage in life where i'd rather have a friend than a hit same it's, i mean and i it's easier to say because we've had some you know we can pay the rent friends last longer <laughs> oh my god <laughs> And so nowadays, friends probably pay more. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> it's a crazy thing, but it's um, some days we get underpaid and we all gripe about how songwriters are not getting commission. And then some days we get overpaid. Yeah. Because some days you write Red Solo <laughs> Cup and you get it, you know. <laughs> so I'm not trying, like it doesn't, I will say this recently, it doesn't define me. It doesn't. No, it doesn't mean. Your, your path is interesting to me too, because you, you were a, you were a songwriter first. And then yeah. you became an artist. I mean, maybe you were probably an artist before, but. Well, it kind of, my path was strange because it's like, I wanted to be an artist. I just like, I came out like during the 90s and I was about to sign a, a big record deal with Columbia Records and it didn't work out. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I had a, a conversation with Miranda one time and it was right before the CMAs and I was like, I bet you're going to have a blast and you get to go get your hair done and get... She goes, I have to get up at four in the morning and I have to do phoners and then I've got to go and do this thing for CMT and then I've got to go do this. She's like, <clears throat> people don't understand. I don't really get to go to birthday parties and funerals. She's like, I'm working all the time. This is my job. This is my life. Everything about it is my life. And I looked at her and I just was like, realized in, the, in my heart, in my moment, I was thanking God that that didn't happen to me. Because I got to be with my, you know, my grandmother when she passed away. And I got to be at my friend's weddings. And I got to see all of these things that you really sacrifice if you're an artist. I feel the exact same way. And I've said it many times. Like, God knows what he's doing. And that was not the life for me. It was not the life for me either. And I would have ended up being miserable. And, and so I did get to write my way into being an artist. But... Even so, even now, right now, <laughs> I feel like, did you ever see Field of Dreams? Yeah, oh yeah. Do you know the doctor who gets to go play baseball yeah, this yeah, one time? <laughs> I am the doctor. I got to play baseball this summer. Uh, I got to open for my dear friend and it was amazing. I don't know if this is something I wanna do all the time. Because yeah, you get, to, you, you get to cherry pick. You get to pick and choose yeah. the cool things you want to do and you're like fantasy baseball camp. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. I would tell a quick story that my mother's going to hate, but like we, we <laughs> this is many <laughs> years ago before I was sober, but it was like 20 years ago and me and my brother Brett and Red Akins were standing outside the CMA Awards and one of those years we were nominated for duo of the year because there weren't any duos. And uh, Willie Nelson <laughs> walked by us and and Rhett said something smart to him like, like hey, I'll... Uh, if Toby won't smoke weed with you, we will, because he had that song. And he said, come on, boys. And we went and got on his bus. And and like I felt like I got the Fantasy Camp Willie Nelson tour. He gave us all little bottles of Whiskey River whiskey. Yeah. Like he had boxes of them, and they were there like for guests. It was almost like I know that there's going to be some young artists yeah. that are going to make their career. And then there was this really tall guy that was just rolling joints. And he, yeah. ro he could roll like a marble light with his hands. <laughs> it was crazy. It was like... <laughs> And so we were drinking this Whiskey River, and then he would roll a joint and pass it around. And at the time, I don't smoke weed anymore. It's been a long time, Mom. But um, <laughs> we did, like, a couple of hits of this weed, and he, Willie was sitting over there laughing. And and honestly, I lost, like, two days of my life. 
And we were sitting there. I'm like, oh my god, this isn't really happening. This this because of the marble light rolled uh, joint in the whiskey river. I thought, oh my god, this is the the Willie Nelson fantasy baseball camp. <laughs> hey, he do it. And then he just sent us on our way out the bus and like, oh, what do I do with the rest of my 48 hour high here? Right, exactly. It's terrible, but it was great. <laughs> Anyway, I don't know why I even said that, but it, was, well, it made me think of that. You know, we we get to experience these um, these glimpses of. I feel like I get to. Um, I've I've been able to glimpse into what my what that would have been like for me, right? Oh, I, and I don't know if I liked it. I tell my wife all the time we've gotten a front row seat on the like money doesn't just necessarily bring happiness and fame is a yeah. natural movie. We get to watch those things. Um, in a not so subtle segue, segue uh, I have a quote for everybody when they come on here. I just kind of okay, yes. Please. And so uh, your quote that I that I found was from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's one of my heroes, of course. And uh, he said, uh, "Being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing God's will." Mm. And um, yeah, it's interesting because I think we. You and I and Brett, I don't know. It's funny, you brought Maren Morrison to write with us like years and years ago. She was just like a teenage oh, girl. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot and about that. She had no yes. record deal. She, just, she was very quiet. She she didn't sing, you know? And I was like, oh, we should have gotten her to sing a little bit that day. <laughs> I was probably like singing over everybody. Oh, I, we mowed <laughs> over her, this quiet little talented. Anyway, um, uh, so we wind up in these spiritual and religious talks. But I didn't know like about you being a Christian or about your upbringing or anything until we knew each other. And I think... There's a lot of people that lead with yeah. dogma and yeah. their opinion of what's going on. And it's so much less effective being in recovery. We have this progress, not perfection, and we have attraction rather than promotion. Like, And I think the attraction of Christianity and actively doing God's will is so much more effective than the, oh, that's yeah, the sin. Yeah, in your face. Avoiding sin and trying not to go to hell. That was all my childhood was. Yeah. And uh, it didn't work out that well for me. And, Right. Well, and you know, I we all grew up under that umbrella as well. Um, and that, you know, sin destroys people's souls and, and bodies. It's really what the takeaway message really is. And that's why God doesn't want us to do that. But I do feel like the world is so hard to navigate um, that it's like Christianity is more of a tool of, of to know to know a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, with God and and it's just really, it's been a real, uh, I mean, I've gone through the same thing. I've gone through times where I'm just like, I don't, I don't like God. I, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to be religious. But I, there's so many hurting people, <laughs> especially in the world, especially in the entertainment music industry. Um, and I, I'm genuinely interested in listening to people's stories. And I really do feel like Jesus was the same way. Yeah. You know, he, I think there he wanted to talk to the tax collector, but he wasn't like talking at them. He or down to them. Or down to them. Yeah. And so I just sort of like for me, I don't always lead off with that, but I just try to serve and be an example of it. And also just try to I don't know. I I wanna I like knowing about where people come from and understanding what makes them tick and and then maybe if I can serve them in some sort of way, like that's that's my job. Yeah, kind of like Amy so. said with the music. Like, I also be interested in somebody else's opinion. Yeah. I have better conversations with people I disagree with. And the, the people I agree with, I feel like we're all drifting off towards one side a little too far. Yeah, for and, sure. And uh, sometimes the, the uh, and I think that what you said about sin, yeah, I think that's true. Like, it, sin does cause this, but I don't know, but all sin does, not just the sins but we when want you're to cherry focused pick. on, if, it's more about like, it's almost like, I don't, I don't want to compare it to a game, but it's like, if you only focus on all the rules of the game, it's not fun to actually get involved in the game, right? right. So it's like Christianity is really beautiful too. It's like yeah. miraculous. And it's funny that you're doing this podcast because my whole, one of the reasons why I wanted to come on here is because like, I just wanted to kind of uh, talk about my experience with you know, if I had been um, an artist during this time, my grandmother had had a stroke and we had, my mother and I, she lived here. I was very, very close to her. My my parents took her in and, but I was, I, I literally walked through every day with her during the dying process. And it was probably one of the most hardest and most beautiful times of my life. And, 
you know, I know you lost your son in a very sudden way, yeah. but it's like, I just, walking with someone while they're slowly leaving this world, I just wanted to t share with you this experience that I had of my grandmother when she was in hospice. She was not on any medication whatsoever. And so um, it was the night she was about to pass away and she's laying on the bed and her eyes are halfway shut and she's heavy breathing <sighs> like that. And I'm just like reading scripture. My family's there. And then it's about four in the morning. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden she goes, <gasps> and she started looking up and she started looking around her and her eyes look like a child and her eyes were so big and she had a smile on her face. And it was like, it was the most, it, instead of making me like cry even yeah. deeper, it made me like, what is happening? I've never seen heaven on somebody's face. Mm. And literally she was doing this for 30 minutes because I'm looking at the watch and I'm, I I'm want to know the exact precise time that she passed away. And literally, and she just slowly, slowly, and then closed her eyes and took her last breath. And I'm gonna tell you something, cause you and I have had these discussions. After that, I started like looking up like, what do people see in the afterlife? What are people looking at when they go to heaven? What are people doing at that very moment? And I, I did you ever read 90 Minutes in Heaven? Um, yes, is that about the a, Eben, is that the surgeon? I've read so many books. Don Piper, who passed away, he was a pastor. Yeah, and yes, he yeah. Spent all this time. I, I've read so many books on that in the last two and a half years, uh, and I know I've shared with you my near-death obsession. Uh, yes. we, we've talked about it <laughs> at length. Uh, that's amazing story, but by the way. I, yeah, I just feel like you know, especially whenever my grand and this is the same grandmother who told me she said, "If I die and you bring me back, I'm going to kill you." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And but to see someone heaven on someone's face is just like. It's changed my life. This happened before all of my success, if you will. And it's also changed the way, you know, my writing mm -hmm. and my hopefulness. Like I like writing songs like Rainbow. I like writing songs like Crowded Table because I really do, watching heaven be on in someone's eyes that I'm very close to, I just, there's so much more to this world Right, we're not here for very long. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, I, I I've told you, but I mean, but Rainbow, when you play, we've so we've probably done five or six, seven gigs together uh, since since my son died. And when you play that song, I think of him. Yeah, and, I, and but not in like in a, in a grateful way. It's like this. Um, what you described. I was having a conversation yesterday with my brother and a guy that we were writing with, and they were talking about pain and death and, and their, their wives being paranoid about death. And, and I said, let me just tell you something. There's a few things that I feel like I'm sure of. But if you're feeling pain, don't worry about dying because you're not going to die. Because when you're dying, I don't think you feel any pain. You I've don't feel any research. pain. You don't. So, so <laughs> yeah. if you're feeling pain, stop worrying about dying because you're going to maybe you're going to be in the hospital. Maybe you broke your leg and, and maybe you're either going to be, you know, uh, have broken bones. But I don't feel like when you're dying that you're going to have any pain. And your grandmother's reaction was, my best friend's mom was dying. She did pass away about about a year ago. And when she was dying, he's like, I mean, she's lost her mind. She's going crazy. Brett, she, she doesn't want to watch TV or anything. And she just looks out the window and, and with a big smile on her face. And I said, Mike, she's... That's wonderful. <laughs> I said, That's, your mom's she's one foot in heaven. She's... Yeah. Shouldn't even. I'm like, what? Why in the world, knowing that was coming, would you want to watch TV? Right. You know, exactly. I still do because I'm an idiot and I'm here on Earth and I'm still entertained by the ridiculousness of of the entertainment we can provide for each other. But when you get to that point, um, I've heard so many things, and and hearing it from my friends is um, makes it even better for me. And my friend Jimmy Lee Slow, since a bass player, I don't know if you know Jimmy, but he yeah, has I know a, Jimmy. He was he was in Imperials too. <laughs> oh my God, that's right. He did. Oh God, the tiniest. Yeah. Oh, the tiniest world. But he he lost a child as well, so he and I have been yeah. very very close on this road, and and um, we talk about him. he has a, a near death experience, a, a, a heaven when he was a child before he had any conception of yeah. heaven, didn't even know, and he said he still sees it like he did 
Yeah. Like as clear as it was then. And there's just too many, too much consistency. And I feel like that is that information that those people get to have and what your grandmother got to experience instead of it just happening after she was gone is a gift to people like me and like you so that it you is. were able to know where she is. It's a gift. I, I get peace from that. It's a gift to die in your in your bed. It's a gift, but it's also a gift to see somebody leave this world that was so who impacted the world. I find know? myself strangely attracted to the dying. That's gonna sound really strange, but like um, my friend Eric Close, the actor that was on Nashville, in fact, he's yes. gonna come on here with me. His brother died last Christmas. And I have a story uh, about him that I just, the day he died, I was with them. Yeah. And um, I was touching him and I could feel sage with me. And I did, I felt it as real yeah. as, as it is here. And it's the kind of thing I would have thought you were, well, people are crazy and you're making that up and you want to feel that and your emotions are taking over. But, um, and I had a Bill Loki. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's a therapist that wrote most of the on-site curriculum. Okay. And he has That's like the amazing. worst cancer that literally weeks or months to live. And we sat and talked and I, and I just said, you're theoretically, you're going to see my son before I am. So I want to be with you. And I, I'm like, I want to, like the time I get to spend with that man yes. um, who's very comfortable. He's more comfortable with the death than he is. The, so he's like, I'm a little more worried about the suffering I'm going to have to do before I get to that. Yeah, the suffering but, is, is, once you've seen, see, and what, once you understand the suffering of Jesus Christ, once you've seen when he, somebody you love suffer, it's just like death is, is, Really beautiful. Yeah. Like, I am i don't want to make it like I'm some superhuman because I'm not afraid of death. I am afraid of dying because I'm yeah. still human. And Same. so I don't want the physical pain and the long goodbyes, but the actual, my wife and I discussed it this morning. I'm like, the actual death part, just not afraid of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm half and half. I mean, I, I'm not afraid to die. I think I'm more afraid for my family after, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But I also, um, you know, I, you know, also when you are, because I was a sick kid, I always, you know, believed in heaven and there's just this weird, I, I'm like you, I'm strangely attracted to these subject matters and um, actually Shay McAnally, our friend, he always joked, goes, I wouldn't know if somebody died if you hadn't posted it on Instagram. <laughs> I was like, stop it. I'm not the grim raper. So that's your thing, huh? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not writing obituaries, but I would um, say if Natalie posts about you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, but oh. I I definitely uh, you know, it's just the thing that's hard about dying is that just you don't get to see them until you do. So yeah. yeah. But I, I'm always reminded of we're not here very long. And there's a reason why we still are here. And we have to live out the life that God has given us, right? Sometimes I feel like Jerry Seinfeld. It's like, it's, where it's, you know, life is short. And then I'm like, eh, it's kind of taking forever. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it, totally. there's, there's a little bit of that, but I, I it's agree. too long. <laughs> the thing about talking about it and getting comfortable with it, but it's coming. That's the one thing that's absolutely for sure. I know. And I don't think, well, we, we live in a world today where we don't like to talk about it. Yeah, Once, and, and, and people say death and taxes. Well, you can evade taxes. It's tough. Yes. And you might get caught, but you can't, you can't evade death. Even no, Methuselah can. died. You know, we're all going to die. Yeah, one out of one person died. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, so it's not like you have to dwell on it, but the truth is if you can get where you are and where I am, where it's a beautiful thing, and and I mean, done right. I want to do this life right. Yeah, absolutely. I, and even more well, it's so. It's weird. It makes you want to live when you've been through, when you've lost somebody, you do you go through the grieving process, but it also makes you uh, live even more. Everything, your senses are so much more alive. Yeah, um, than- yeah. I don't know about. So your your grandfather, your grandmother died. Then your grandfather that you did the documentary about. Well, this about. year I've had. It's been a, a hell of a year. This year it's been ups and downs of all sorts, but. Uh, this year, we lost my father-in-law, who was an incredible human being. I it was, I couldn't have asked for He was the first person I met of my husband's family. Wow. And then uh, we lost my aunt, um, and she died. She had cancer, but one of her treatments didn't go well, and um, they gave her a short time to live. And then my grandfather passed a couple weeks later. And my grandfather lived to be 93, and I was very, very close with him. but. Also, I just like, I, it was such a hard year, but I've had such peace about it because 
It is a gift to be able also to say goodbye to somebody and to love, know that you, they, that you loved them and they loved you and, and that sort of thing. But it's sort of like, I don't know. I've strangely dealt with it pretty well this year, but. I don't think strangely, because once you get, when you saw your grandmother and how that happened, your piece about now a life cut yeah. short, losing my son at 21. And this, I'm going to have some tough moments for the rest. Oh, of the for sure. Every day. I yes. have a tough moment every day. It may be fleeting. It may be lasting, but I'm going to have some tough moments. It's, it is hard to lose young people. It's just, it is. Yeah. There's, there's, it's a very deep wound and nobody can really understand it until you are in that club and nobody wants to be in that club. Nobody wants to be in that club. It's not the natural order of things. And I, I have come to the realization that it doesn't matter if you lost an infant at birth or if you're 80 and you lost your 60-year-old son, there's something unnatural about losing a child. Absolutely. And the bond that we have, the parents that I am with a lot, and I am so grateful for them and hate the way that we're close, but we're close. Um, there's just there's just something uh, that you don't understand unless you get there. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm different about death because after losing my son and knowing how I'm getting comfortable with that, my wife's grandfather died. He's the sweetest man. He was about four foot eight, Italian guy. He looked like a little mob boss. And he was 97 <laughs> years old and he never owned a home. Uh, they lived in a rented house in Buffalo, New York. He worked on the, he was in World War II and then he worked on the assembly line in, in, uh, in Buffalo, New York for GM. Wow. And worked his 40 years or whatever it was. The sweetest man, like he literally, till the day he died, would give me, send me like ten dollars for my birthday. I'm like, oh, I pop that. it on, you know. And he, was, he was, no, I'd, I'd rather give than receive. That was his thing. No, I'd rather give than receive. Aww. Would give this to the point that we everyone had to start getting his mail because if someone said they had a, you know, a relative that had been kidnapped overseas and mail thing, he would send them all his money. I mean, the sweetest man ever. He never owned a home. Was raised in an orphanage. It was an or, you know, um, long story. And I thought when he died, I was so happy for him. I'm like, that guy, if it's based on oh. earth, that dude's got the best you of everything. He ran the race, right? Yeah, he ran the race and he did it part. Like, so how on earth could I be not happy for that guy yeah. moving on to something better? And so trickling down, my friend's mom that died in her 60s and he's upset. And I'm like, I am upset, but I'm also, she's looking out the window and she's not wanting to watch TV. I know she knew where she was going and she had that experience. And it, it, so if I can bring that all the way from my 97 year old, grandfather-in-law down to my 21 year old son i'm experiencing pain but he's not yeah, absolutely and so that gives me the that gives me the peace to get through the day uh my grandfather who passed away he was one of nine kids and his his wife my grandmother she was one of 13 and my grandmother she oh. lost three siblings and she ended up being the oldest for years from illness from they were very very poor i I always, I have so much respect for my elders because of all the things that they went through. They didn't have modern medicine and they didn't have a car and things like that. But my grandparents lost a child when the baby was four months old from influenza. And I've just like, there's this, my grandmother for years was obsessed with babies. Like she always loved babies. And there is just something though, when she passed away, it was just like, I was so happy for her because she got to see that baby, you know? And that there's just like, that is, that is what we need to be talking about. Yeah. When we run our final race, we get to see those that we loved so much. You That's know? the magic. The, the thing about um, loss, and I think maybe it happened for you Early, how old? How, well, I'm not going to get into your age, but how you were when your grandmother died. But it was before you had a career and were, and yeah. were successful. But getting to be at peace with that thing. Twenty nine or thirty. Yeah. So that's that's early ish because when I was twenty nine or thirty, I literally had the maturity of a seventeen year old. <laughs> okay, yeah, when I was thirty five, I, I, I can trace adulthood back to the day I got sober, basically. <laughs> hey, I was a small child before that's a that. Good day. Yeah, it's a good yeah. day for everyone. <laughs> But um, but ba basing your perspective on that day helps you. I'm so I'm I say it all the time. I'm probably repeating myself on here a lot. But I'm better at everything since my son died. Yeah. Everything in my life is better except 
for missing him because he's given me a perspective. I've been afraid to fly my whole life and I've done it. You know, it's funny, they were like, how did you do that career? Okay, you and I share this. <laughs> I swear we are like, we've, we've been on some similar path. I'm terrified of flying. I was terrified for, I almost got a, you, we have very, you have to tell your story and I'll tell mine. All right, so I'm in a plane <laughs> in 19, I don't know, 1993 or four, 1992 yes. or three, right before I met my wife. A bunch of bands going to call it the Orange to Apple Tour, going from Florida to New York to showcase rock bands. And we were doing our thing. And we had a flight and the, the flight, it free fell. We, we free fell in the air. It hit an air pocket or something. So the drink cart was yeah, in the, the aisle and it hit the ceiling. The flight attendants were the screaming. Yeah. The, the, the pilots wound up getting off the plane before everyone else and leaving with, with shirts full of coffee. Terrible, terrible experience. Mass fell down, whatever. Never explained what it was. I've been afraid to fly since then. Well, someone says, how did you fly so much in your career? I said, well, I was as afraid as I was to fly. I was even more afraid of failure. <laughs> so <laughs> so well, I remember we got signed and we sat out. Ken Levitan was our manager and, and we sat out at a table and they gave us our schedule that we were going to do. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be on an airplane yeah. three times a week yep. for the next two years. That's what you do. And so I just got a prescription for Xanax and drank my face off until I became <laughs> got in recovery and, um, and got through it. The irony is, so when I got sober 17 years ago, it's it really cured itself for the most part, the fear yeah. of flying. It was just much better. I surrendered my life and will to God, and it's just been better. But still, a little antsy, you know, you check in the weather the night before, whatever. Right. Now, um, and there are, are moments, but now, my, my wife and I get on a plane, and it's bouncing all over the sky, and people are shrieking and getting on, and we're giggling. It just, we just it's don't just care. Like yeah. We just don't even notice it. Um yeah. I said to someone the other day, they said, how was your flight? And I said, oh, it was perfect, smooth. And, and my wife said, that was bumpy. And I'm like, oh, was it? Like, <laughs> I, I don't. Well, it's funny because, uh, yeah, when you've, so that's when a you've blessing. ridden a roller it's a little, coaster, it's like yeah. little bumps don't really mean yeah, anything exactly. anymore. My, my, I was 12. No, I was about 11 or 12. I was with my, my grandmother. And uh, I talk about my grandparents a lot. I, I, I was very close to them. But we went to Florida to go see my uncle and, we were flying Braniff Airlines, and it's in the middle of the day, and like what is Braniff Airlines? Bra exactly. Okay. And yeah. so uh, we were flying, and it, this is back when they used to give you dinner, and we were like eating, and we got our little trays and everything, and all of a sudden we feel the plane going down like this, and then it pulls up so hard and so fast that our legs are like coming up like this, and the plane is shaking, and then it goes back down. And we were we lost cabin pressure, so we I'm 11 years old, and I <laughs> when you're when you're a kid and you think you're gonna die, it really sticks with you for a long time. <laughs> so we the flight attendants we had to put our masks on, and every time a flight attendant would walk by, I'd be like, Are we gonna die? Are we gonna die? Like, <laughs> and then my grandmother, who's like literally a Pentecostal preacher almost at this point. She's like, Lord Jesus, we pray, Father, in the name of the Lord. You just lay this plane, Lord. We ask, Father, that you. I mean, it was like, it was so intense, okay? Jeez. But we get down there finally, and the pilots are, they're not covered in coffee. They're covered in sweat. Their shirts, it's like they jumped in the pool. And all of our shampoo bottles exploded. But literally, I... I don't even know how we got on the, back on the plane that day. I was terrified, but I've never, I've never been so terrified. If you've ever, have you ever experienced, have you ever been so terrified you're shaking? I've never been that way. And that's the only time, like we all get nervous going on a roller coaster or something, but there's still this like assurance. I'm fine. It's, we're strapped in. It's going to be fun. But I was, I couldn't stop shaking uncontrollably. It's like, it's like a shell shock. And for years, I would get on a plane. I'd be praying. I'd have prayer groups praying for me. And then when I could drink, I started drinking on the plane. And then Which I doesn't was really like, help, by the way. It speeds it your heart rate help. up and all that. I, it makes I, you I, tired. I, it took like, me five years of drinking on a plane to figure that <laughs> out. But. Yeah. Well, my, my turnaround was I went to go ride with Dirks Bentley. And me and a bunch of other riders, like Ashley Gorley, Ross Copperman, Luke Dick, and uh, JR was on the flight. And we're coming back and we had to fly through the remnants of Hurricane Harvey and we were just bouncing all over the sky. And it was so funny. Uh, 
Luke was like, I almost took up a religion. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm agnostic man. I literally was praying like my grandma was like, I was like, Lord Jesus, please let this play. But, uh, after that, I, you know, I'm with you. I'm like, Oh, it's, it's, it was a little kind of like when l the, the losing the child thing. Sometimes I'm like, bring it on physical pain, emotional pain, yeah. spiritual pain. Like I, I'm, I'm trying to, um, you had something written in your um, on an Instagram that that Lisa sent me last night that you said, and it was like the the grateful for the grateful for the the pain, grateful for the sunshine, for grateful the for all of it. Yeah, I, the growth, and I and I'm not perfect at this because who is? It's called pain for a reason. <laughs> it's because exactly, it's unpleasant. Exactly. But I am getting to the point where when it's bad, whatever it is, and it and and it's bad, I'm like, okay, today I grow. The day that is great and it's perfect, I'm like, well, today I rest. But I'm not growing the day I rest. No. So I'm looking at the, trying to look at the pain, whatever physical, spiritual, emotional pain, whatever, as this is, I get to grow today. Absolutely. And it's caused me to do things in a different way. It's really weird. I wouldn't want to start my career with this perspective. Uh, no, no, no. I really don't care about some of the BS that we, the political. I don't either. You don't seem like you ever have. And you wind up in the coolest spots. By the way, one for one reason, you're the most talented. Between you and Jesse Alexander, I can sit. <laughs> there are not the women that it's you write for and talented. work with cannot sit down with an acoustic guitar and do what you do. Well, they can't. So that that is a reason. But also the the lack of panic on you when it's time to do something cool. It's like it will come. I actually might have been better off in my career if I had just had this perspective because I really believe in letting it come. And if there's something I'm gonna miss, I talk to writers. Oh God, I'm gonna miss getting on that. I'm like, man, I don't have FOMO. Yeah, I have Jomo. I don't care if I miss it. I'm supposed to miss it. I'll wait around, and I would rather have, like I said, I'd rather have a friend than a hit. That is so not me. Yeah, I, that's how I've. My motto is uh, uh, friends before music. Wow. And you have to subscribe to that. Now, some people don't, and I just can't operate that any other way. I can't be like, you know, I've seen what music does to people when they put it first. I don't really like it. <laughs> um, and so for me, at least. And so uh, to me, I friendship is way more important than music. So, um, but, you know, some people might disagree with that. So it's okay. How, so how many of these do you do a month? I'm trying to do two a month. Okay. And release something every other week. Yeah, that's great. There's a tiny bit of a stockpile, but it's been, you know, my biggest fear on this whole thing was, um, like, I hate asking people, I hate asking people to do a writer's night for your kid's school, and I hate asking, hey, will you come be on my podcast? And the truth is, I'm other than the people that were easy to ask, <laughs> okay, so you asked, Ernest asked, uh, my friend Eric Close, it's an actor, the people that I was, like, there's some guys, like, the people that lost kids, like Casey and, and Jeffrey Steele, they on Two seconds. Yeah, yeah, that was, like, that was easy. Um and then Al, uh, Al is, is kind of like Al and I are kind of, he's like one of my three best friends in the whole world. We like oh, hang yeah. out a lot and we go, I mean, so we're, so that was real easy for him to do the first one. But the, the truth is we kind of like, I'm like, God, this is your thing. I'm just, I'm right now in obedience. And, yeah. and it, whatever has gone on has been, the response has been awesome. But the people that, that it's yeah. meant something to and the people that I wanted to be on, I have offered like you did like I wanted you to be and I would have asked you at some point but I really would have rather you said hey I'm yeah and that's how it's happened and the same it's almost like a record like you don't want to ask your friends to listen to it yeah <laughs> exactly right and especially or before like, you had or retweet about it or anything like it feels so disingenuous like so you have to have a first few so they could so Al was easy and then Jeffrey and Casey were easy ones and I had Ashley Cleveland on and there's like no, there's going to be some that are not, maybe, maybe more challenging, obviously. So, yeah, it is interesting to me uh, your your lack of, um, I don't know, chase it down. It, I'm, I know that you work your you work your ass off. I'm not saying you, I know that you work hard, but you never seem panicky about it. And you, I think that keeps you from doing things you're not supposed to do. And I would love to go back and see what would happen if I wasn't panicky and just took things as they came. I'm way better at that now. I'm well, like really not in a hurry. I'll tell you, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm not is because I, I mean, I had, doors were shutting all for years. I mean, I'm so used to the door shutting that I'm just like, it's almost like Dolly Parton, like when she, I saw some interview of her and she was like, I'm not really afraid 
of anything because I've been so poor. And I feel like <laughs> I've been told no so many times that I'm like, well, if it's no again, then okay. I'll, I, I just feel like, you know, you're this little stream trying to find its way through these these rocks. And it's like, okay, well, I can't go this way. Well, I'm going to go this way then. <laughs> well, it's funny. What are you grateful for as you look back? And like, I'm grateful for the struggles because it made me whatever it is that's good. And and the same thing with like career or finances. My, my middle son is 22 and he just graduated from college and he works for the, the football team at Western Kentucky making almost no money. Yeah. Like it's almost like a paid internship. He lives with five guys in a house. He's broke. And I'm like, that is so good for you to so be great. broke and to yes. struggle. And he knows how to, he can... He could live on almost nothing. Actually, he's so cheap that he could really live on almost nothing. Well, but I'm like, you need, we need that struggle. Yeah. Oh, I I worked at Comcast for like almost four years, and and I still wrote music. What'd you do at Comcast? I worked in marketing, and that sounds I was miserable. It was it was really challenging, but I really loved the people I worked with. And um, actually, I have a really great story. I have a bunch of girlfriends. Um, African American. We all went to we went to their church one day. <laughs> they oh, called it Bible black study. Church is so much better it's than white church. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. So much better. Yes. And uh, I was the only white person there, proudly. Uh, but I was like, they were like, the pastor got up. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have nothing going on in my career, but he said, "People, do not be jealous if God chooses to bless your neighbor." Because don't you know when God blesses your neighbor, that means he's in the neighborhood. <laughs> and literally, I took that and I remembered that all through my... So whenever Pontoon won for Song of the Year, I got up and I said those exact words and told him the story. But it's like, that is a very key thing about being in music is <laughs> God like, bless your neighbor. He's in the neighborhood. He's in the neighborhood. <laughs> Every time I, there's a young writer that says, man, I had almost had this and I almost had this and I almost had this and none of them happened. I said, good, you're due. Yeah. Every every success I've ever had came after three near misses or five near misses of this was going to be the single on this guy's oh. album. This was going to be the single. And, and you're just like, you're oh, not yeah. successful if if you haven't had those stories. This I mean, I'm like, grateful for those stories because otherwise at some point, things are going to roll down. I, I feel like if we were given everything we wanted when we wanted it, we would all be a bunch of jerks and assholes. So it did, just, you know, <laughs> yeah, agreed. I, oh my God. The things, you know, it's funny. Like God will give you the desires of your heart. It isn't the things that will change that you're getting. It's the desires that you have that will change. Absolutely. Yeah, That's it's, a really great point. It, it's funny. If someone asked me the other day, like, what do you want? Because you got to, oh, Jordan Peterson has a great podcast about it. And, and, it, yeah. and at some point he's got so many, He's my hero. Yeah. Um, but he says, you have to know what you want. Yes. Before you can get it. You have to ask for it. But he, like most people say, what do you want? And they go, well, I'd like for the, no, no. What do you want? And uh, so I asked myself, what do you want? Yeah. I want peace. That's what I want. I want That's peace. That's what I want too. And so. I want to be respected too. I don't want yeah. to be necessarily famous. I want to be respected. Well, um, you are. So there, good. You got half of that. Half of that's hopefully. already accomplished. <laughs> No, no, you're respected. We'll see. We'll see how long it lasts. It's interesting because you're more respected than the famous people that you're working with. Because wow. everyone just looks at famous. Well, there's got to be some X factor in there. But with a person that's, yeah, you're 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 so respected, you would be uncomfortable if you knew how much. <laughs> well, that's. I don't know. I, I all I know is though is that um, I do, do. We love what we do, right? I love music. I love writing songs. Uh, there's nothing greater to me job wise and writing a song that I just am so crazy about. Yeah. And that nobody will ever hear. So <laughs> <laughs> I love to playing I I still love playing out, playing a song that people like in a bluebird setting or something where they don't really sure what you did or what you've written and playing a song that's like somebody's favorite song and they didn't know you wrote it and they didn't know they were gonna hear the person sing it. That yeah, wrote it that day. Yes, I love that. I still love to perform. Yeah, I do too. It makes it makes it to me. To, the performance is the enjoyment of it, and sometimes the the mental ditch digging that we do during a day. It is. It's like now I do love finish writing a song that that comes right. out and it's great. And then there are still days that are like, yes, yeah. this, this. I don't know if this song's any good, but this process sucks. I wouldn't want anyone to see it being made. Well, you know, it's funny too. Sometimes like the process. Um, because you're so in the trenches, you don't really know it's a good song until later. Um, or you don't really know its impact. Um, I wrote this song called Jealous with 
Labyrinth and Josh Keir um, years ago in 2010. And it, it's the most heartbreaking song. Um, and literally we wrote it in bits and pieces and never heard a thing about it again. And then it, he put it out like five, actually when I wrote with him, his name was Timothy. <laughs> I didn't know his name was Labyrinth. And they, someone told me, they were like, Labyrinth is going to put out your song. And I'm like, who is Labyrinth? But this <laughs> song, Jealous, is like, it was a single out in the UK. And then like a bunch of people, it kind of caught wind here. And then they started playing all these, like The Voice and those types of shows. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I didn't know at the time what it what a just a heartbreaking and beautiful song. It was. Sometimes you're so involved in making something that I don't... I'm not saying I'm Michelangelo or anything. No, it's Michelangelo. With Michelangelo? I was, I'm from the South of Michelangelo. <laughs> Michelangelo. Maybe you want to cut this part out. <laughs> no, I, but you know what I was like? I just wonder if like... Well, you do have a knack for writing the... It's either the happiest sad songs ever or the saddest happy songs ever. I don't know which it is. But like so Rainbow true. is the saddest happy song it is. I've ever heard or the happiest sad song. I'm not sure what it is, but the emotions, I, I mean, when you play that song, well, it's like I float into a different space because I think about my son and I think about the good fortune we we have to be sorrowful, which is yeah. crazy. Um, because joy and sorrow are so connected and joy is. is so much more important than happiness. And you know how people say, what do you, I just want my kids to be happy. I don't even say that anymore. I don't want that. Happiness is fleeting and it's based on circumstance and it's, I don't, I don't want them to be happy. I want them to be joyful. And I think right. you can only be joyful if you're good and if you and if you have a relationship with with a higher power. I, that, I agree. I the joy of the Lord. You yeah. Know? I yeah. so believe in that. And and um that you have a knack for like I don't know if Bluebird's supposed to be happy or sad, but it's both. <laughs> you know? I, you're I teetering love that Bluebird. line all the time. It kills me, but it's yeah. Bluebird is so to me, it's it's very hopeful. I love hopeful songs. Yeah, not cheesy hopeful. Like, just like, hey, it's a little rough right now, but it's gonna get better. Because yeah. that's how I really do feel about life. You know. Yeah. Now, sometimes, I don't know. We all get knocked off our pedestals, and I think knocked, joy is have, a smoothie full of of happiness and sadness. It is. You know what I mean? Did you ever see the uh, Disney movie? Uh, What's the Disney movie called? Help me out here. It's that one with the feelings, joy, sadness, uh, inner. No, will you look that up for well, me? I can tell you I didn't. My youngest, okay. <laughs> my, my youngest kid's 18, so I haven't seen a Disney movie since he was uh, six. Pixar, can you tell me? I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. I watched Toy Story. That was good. Why do they got to rip your... Inside Out. Yeah. Inside Out. I the, can't in, remember that. In yeah. the movie Inside Out, it talks about... It's like all of these emotions are these little characters in the movie. And in the end, it's so funny because happiness is trying to push out sadness all the time, right? Oh, wow. And she's just trying to keep her like, or she's trying to make her happy. She's trying to like get her going. But in the end, this little girl's feelings, and she needed both, she needed sadness to come back around. And, and, and it, it is, it's just a mixture of both of those things. Al Andrews read me a poem on here. I think it was on here. I can't ever tell. I talked to Al so much. But it, about like the sadness uh, or sorrow, like giving it a seat at the table. Like get, yeah. let, let it, don't let it over, don't let it take the conversation over. Yeah. But give it a seat at the table. Let it have its due. Let it, it's, it's part of the table. It is part of our thing. It is. And learning how to embrace that. Like I, I've, I've said many times now, I, I wish I could go back and live the last 20 years with the perspective that I have now. Because oh, yeah. I would have accomplished way more, and I don't mean in monetary things and hit songs and and whatever, but I would be a better friend, a better father, a better husband, a better worker, just a better uh, light in the world based on the idea that, I, I don't know, man, we, we need uh, all of the emotions. The collection of who I am is so much more complete now, and... Um, I have a friend that says you're not who you think you are. You're not who they think you are. And you're most certainly not who you think they think you are. That's so and true. And if I could wash away all the 20 years of worrying about what other people thought of me, they would probably think more of me and it wouldn't matter. Oh, yeah. I mean, we all, we don't, 
it's like we care, we don't care what people think about us. We're in a business full of shallow <laughs> shit. We are. Yeah. We are dredging the. We few. want to be invited to the party, but we don't want to go. Yes. <laughs> okay, so here's where I am recently. I am actually grateful that I didn't get invited. Instead of being, well, I mean, could have invited. Well, because you don't want to tell them you, you don't want to go. So <laughs> I'm kind of with you on that a little like bit. Like our good friend in common, Josh Keir, he has like a dance party at his house. And I said, Josh, I love you and I love your wife. I don't like dancing. I don't like parties. I don't drink. I, I, I love you, but I'm not going to the dance party. We'll and we're go to dinner always sometime. out of town when he has that. I'm like, well, I can't. I, it's not. It it's just. It's just one of those things that I don't really have to be. I don't have to be invited. And I can. This is a, a, a new one, but I can be literally be my when my friends have success. I'm. I'm honestly happy for them. Not trying to be happy for them. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm really happy for them. Well, God taught me that a long time ago because I had no other choice than to be happy for them because it was just like... <laughs> I was, we were killing it before you were. <laughs> I mean, I was sitting here going... I finally was just like, if you don't want me to do music, fine. Okay, I get it. I'll stop. But I, I then it became like, listen, I just want to do music. I don't care what it looks like. <laughs> I don't care if I'm just, you know, just playing for a friend of mine at her house or something. I don't know. It also allows the town and the industry to root for you when you have that. My One of my best friends is Lance Miller, who you know. I'm, yeah. I'm sure. Songwriter, too. And Lance has been so excited for us as we had hits coming up. Because when I met Lance you know, years yeah. and years ago, we were judges on Nashville Star, and he was a contestant. And we told the world he looked like Chastity Bono, and then we became great friends. <laughs> we really did. <laughs> And he does, but um, and but anyway, we became friends, and we Brett and I were having hits, and Lance got a record deal, and it didn't work out because you know Warner Brothers used to be the the artist protection program, and, and anyway, <laughs> we've been through all these ups and downs, but he always cheered on our careers and was so kind about it. And over and during COVID, Lance had like two number ones in in a six month wow. period, like really close, and it was the time that I was becoming, you know, and I'm like. Oh my God, I'm so glad that I'm genuinely happy. How could I not have been happy oh, for yeah, my friend? For sure. For, because we were at a time when, when we were we were nothing, you know, and, and we hadn't had anything for a minute. And, well, and um, honestly, though, you also were coming up at a time. I mean, Nashville used to be very competitive, like kind of mean. Like everybody looked like they were friends. It's still competitive, really. it's just less mean. Yeah. It's less mean now. Now but, it's more Baptist. Yeah, it's a little more Bless your heart. <laughs> oh, good for you. We'll save some of those hits for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it was it was it was fun to go through and be like, oh, I am really and not not like I wasn't before happy for someone, but I was really genuinely like I was I would rather Lance have had those hits than me to have them at that moment. Yeah, exactly. That was the difference. Not you know why? Because you realize that having hits doesn't really make you happy. It's all fleeting. It's all fleeting. It is. It's just and and it doesn't mean that nothing matters. You know, it's funny. Everything is something, but nothing is everything. Exactly. Like it, it all means something. I don't want to act like. No, was, it's awesome. Like it's it's wonderful. I like, mean, some days our job seems petty, and then right. I think about well, when you sing Rainbow, I know what it does to me, and it makes me think of my son. So there's bound to be something that we've written that puts someone in. But Absolutely. It's it's not pontoon and red solo cup maybe, but those <laughs> you know I. Uh, my first number one was White Liar with with Miranda. That was Miranda's too. And I remember when that went number one, I was right with Tom Douglas the next day. And I said, he's like, are you so excited? And I was like, you know what? Actually, I'm, I'm kind of sad. Well, I don't know what's wrong with me. I feel kind of depressed. And he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, that's pretty normal. I was like, well, why do I feel that way? Because because you think it won't happen again. And I was the ride's like, over. Yeah. yeah, the ride yeah. is over. Yeah. But it wasn't over, but it but it is just so funny how <laughs> we can't even enjoy that one moment. <laughs> it's, it's ironic. Because you're like, is, I got to do this the, again. The worst day in a songwriter's life is the day his song was number one. Because <laughs> they think the song, and that's it. Do you really? And you know what? True. At some point, you're right. Yeah. At some point, that's it. That's the last one. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know when it is. And, and I... I just don't care anymore. I'm, yeah. I'm so grateful to not care anymore. And I shouldn't say that. I mean, like, I, I work hard and I try and I love it. But I mean, well, you I'm care really about writing great songs. You like writing music and that's all you care about. It's like, God, look, there is this whole work e ethic involved, obviously. And there's like things that move in place. But there is this 30% of 
God, luck, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> that that plays into it. And the right work, time, right place. Yeah, the work ethic thing. There's this book called the the relentless pursuit or the relentless elimination of hurry. Oh, like nice. and it's just it's a pastor, but it's a really great book. And and um, we we do too much. Like we yeah. do. Like the idea. I'm I'm paranoid. It's funny I discuss paranoid about being lazy, but the, the fact is. I need to be still more often yeah. and it'll make me a better writer and a better artist and a better musician. The truth, I have all kinds of things going on and, and we, we need to sit more often. So I think sometimes the being afraid to miss a hit, um, you've really done it right because whatever, you don't have the most hits in the world, but you have the best hits. Uh, they are, you have the best collection of songs and it's like, they're all amazing. And, and you've you. been a good Christian person between it and you, it's kind of cool to hear someone that doesn't have, cause everyone I'm, you know, half of my, well, more than half of my friends are these, either have a recovery story or they need one. Oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, <laughs> yeah. and you kind of have done it the right way the whole time. And that doesn't mean that you were perfect. I don't mean to say that, but it is cool to kind of sit and listen to your story and hear the, the beauty and the pain that's still in, even if you do it the right way, yeah. you're still going to have it. Uh, it's pretty awesome. I will. I don't know if it's right, but it's right for me. So I don't. That's the only way I know. And it's like, you know what? Um, we all have. There's some really amazing stories. Your story is amazing, I think. And uh, we all have these things of regret, like throughout our lives. I mean, you can't be successful and not have these stories, to, in my opinion. So, but yeah, the my greatest... story's a little more amazing than I want it to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> Yours is a great movie, though. There's, honestly, um, <laughs> Yours is a movie I want to see. Yeah, yeah. Mine's kind of boring and sad. That's so. another thing about watching like television. I'm like, man, they, there's there are no healthy people on the shows that we watch. <laughs> they don't make they don't make TV shows or movies about healthy, well adjusted people. They're idiots. <laughs> no, and I, they don't make movies with with good resolve either. And and there is good resolve in the world. It's just like they don't ever talk about it. You know? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, before we go, I, I always ask everyone a two question, a two part question at the end, and um, the the questions are: What is the worst thing that ever happened to you, and what is the best thing that came out of that? Oh wow! Let me think about this for a minute. The worst thing that's ever happened to me. Um, let's see. I got old. <laughs> And I'm still work I'm working on it right now. You say you're currently getting old. I'm not sure that qualifies. The worst thing that's ever happened to me. Hold on. I let's see. I think the worst thing, you know, I think this is kind of like it's just now hitting me, but I think um the worst thing that ever happened to me was I bought a house that I wasn't supposed to be in. And it was really horrible at the time. It was uh, an older house. And the reason why is because we thought we weren't supposed to be in this other house because we were building a studio. It wasn't working out. And I know that sounds crazy. It's like I have never been through war or anything, but this is the worst thing because it was... Proof that you've lived a life well, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I bought this house and it was there was a million things wrong with it. But it, to me, it's symbolic of, look, sometimes you're not in the greatest moment of your life, but sometimes that's where you're supposed to be, and you're not supposed to go looking for this other place that you thought you were supposed to be. You know what I mean? Sometimes you're supposed to sit right where you are and walk through it. And I didn't do that and, and paid a dear price for it, but that's... And honestly, I will say, I'm not going to lie, a lot of drinking and a lot of praying got me out of it. So there you go. <laughs> There's a middle ground between it. I always say sometimes the hardest thing to do is nothing. Yeah. It's really hard to do nothing. It's really hard not to move when you think you're supposed to be on the move. But, or, but not to move when you don't like your situation. Exactly. It's, it's easy to sit when you're in the sun in a lawn chair with a, you know. For sure. In, in Florida on the coast. It's hard to sit when you're uncomfortable and it's yes. painful. I'm learning that. Yeah, it's hard to sit when you're on better every day, table. but and I, you know, you said getting old. Like I like getting old. I'm cool with it. Yeah, and not being afraid of death makes me like embrace the every little change coming, and it's like a new challenge. And no, I don't like. I like the wisdom of it for sure. The the physicality, I absolutely hate. <laughs> the physicality. <laughs> 
I mean, it's so, yeah. It's, I'm know, just joking. Being a woman is a whole, you guys, I, I will say that you definitely have a. It's all good. A lot more uh, plumbing. Going <laughs> we on got a lot more do. pipes up in here. <laughs> I feel like I feel like we're a stick man, and you guys are like a three D, a four D figure, you know. Of well, you know. Uh, but it is no. I, I appreciate the wisdom of getting older. Yeah, but. yeah. Or just like, and I guess the truth is, if I had had it earlier, um, I probably wouldn't have. No, I, I don't know wouldn't. what I'd just be sitting in a room somewhere meditating. <laughs> Yeah, you'd be you're you're in so much better of a place. Yeah, your story's got to be your story. It it does, it does. And some people, I you, the saddest stories to me are the ones that peak early, and they just can't. That was their moment. They think. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's like no, and then they can't grow beyond that. Yeah, and so. then the truth is that that if any to have a peak at all is is pretty right. You know, I, I, the other day just for just. I, I pulled up my son's football highlights from high school. He was a great high school football player, you know, and he played yes, baseball and football. He was. And there's a little huddle thing, and they have, I just was going through old emails, discarding things, and I just watched that. And he got to like score touchdowns on Friday nights in, in front of the school. And I'm like, you know, it's, I, I cringe and think about the things that he missed, but we all have moments, and those are our moments, whatever they yeah. are. So we get to choose them. And the truth is, that my whole life has been better than I would have given credit for. But the moments, like, how did it feel when you did this? I'm like, eh, yeah. it wasn't any better than a sunny day. Absolutely. Walking down the beach. I mean, the the, the, the number totally. one, a triple play or to playing in front of 65,000 people in Tim McGraw's band at the Nissan Stadium. That was cool. It was cool. It's kind of nerve wracking. Uh, you know but what I mean? Being in a Clear ocean on a sunny day is really cool, too. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Having peace and, like, w waking up and it all being okay. So, I mean, I, I feel like you had that starting off. I do. I really respect how you've, how you've walked your journey. And um, Well, we all, God forces us to walk all our journeys in different ways, and that yeah. was how mine panned out. So Some of us are slow learners and some of us aren't. And I don't, you know, I know your husband's a producer, and I, I don't know what, um, yes. what, what his story is, but you guys seem, like, really healthy and... and and uh my husband's he's a great man i i you know I, the only thing i'm going to say is like a lot of women we were told that we can do anything and everything and that's not true at all like and i i've the reason why i am successful is because of mike he's helped me so much through my i mean he's held down the fort for me throughout all these years you know and i did for him when he was having his his big moments but it's like that's that's true love, true marriage. And, you know, I, I can't do it all without him. So. Oh, no. Yeah, no. Marriage is one of the greatest gifts. I mean, it's like, it, it's, it, it, it took me a little bit to get it right, but it's like, I can't imagine doing life without. Yeah. Well, I, and we're, we're still trying to get ours right. I, <laughs> I mean, everybody rolling in. Well, thanks for doing this. Thank I love you, you so You're much. Amazing. I love you so much. And, and respect. I mean, honestly, you really need to know that. Like, if there's one oh. word I would describe your career with, it would be respect. And that's well, from everybody. Likewise. You are so loved in our community and our friends and family. But everybody else hates you, so um, you got a lot of work to do. When someone was driving really badly on the road and would cut me off, I would say, "Jesus loves you," but everyone else thinks you're an asshole. I, know. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> chop, chop. All right. You're awesome, Natalie. You're Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much. This is so great. I did see a a shirt. Uh, I just bought it. It says, "Jesus loves you," and I'm trying. <laughs>